Dragons are obviously a thing of fiction, found in fairy tales, folklore, and some show I don't want to talk about. It still hurts. But the idea of dragons didn't just come out of thin air. Like many mythical beasts, they were inspired by real-life nature. The documentary we're featuring today is about one of those myth-inspiring animals, the sun gazer lizard, also known as the giant dragon lizard and by its scientific name, Smaug gigantus. Yes, Smaug like the dragon. This amazingly beautiful lizard is disappearing quickly because of the pet trade and people's desire to own a dragon of their own. And the answer to saving the species may not be found out in the wild, but in a science lab aided by the trusty pipette. Make sure you stick around after the credits for a short Q&A with the filmmakers. Now from producer Siobhan Perusna, this is Saving Dragons. The sun gazer is a 20 million year old species of lizard found only in South Africa. Because of their unique dragon-like appearance, there is a high demand for this species as a pet around the world. But there is a problem. The sun gazer does not breed in captivity, and all the animals we see in the trade worldwide come directly from our threatened South African populations. For a species that is already experiencing population declines because of our land transformation, for farms, cities, and roads, poaching for the pet trade is the last thing that this species needs. My name is Siobhan Parasna, and I'm doing my PhD in zoology at Wits University in South Africa. I've been obsessed with dinosaurs and dragons from as early as I can remember, and this lifelong obsession led me to studying reptiles, and I've spent the last seven years studying the sun gazer. Over this time, I've seen an increase in the number of sun gazers being sold as pets on social media, and a decrease in the number of animals in the wild. Recent studies have found that reptiles are the number one most traded group of animals in the world, making up more than half of all trading animals worldwide. And the sun gazer is one of South Africa's most highly sought after species in the pet trade. But without the species breeding in captivity, something was wrong. It was clear to me that I was seeing some evidence of illegal activity. To learn more about the reptile trade, its history in South Africa and the problems we face, I spoke to two of South Africa's top reptile experts. Johan Maré is undoubtedly the name that comes to most South Africans' minds when it comes to reptiles. Johan has decades of experience dealing with reptile trade issues, from his time as a policeman and honorary officer at the Natal Parks Board, to his frequent consulting with nature conservation on poaching cases. Yes, I started, uh, you know, I started at, uh, with snakes at a very young age, in my teens, and, and I've never been uh, in favour of the exploitation of reptiles specifically. Um, and I think my first real involvement was back in 1979. So the trade in reptiles was really, really big in the 60s and 70s. It was massive. And there was one major exporter who was shipping out 20, 30, 40,000 reptiles a month. Just tons and tons. And by the time the reptiles got to the airport, a quarter or more of them would be dead. And it didn't matter because they were bought for nothing and they were sold for next to nothing. And what they did in those days, they'd drop a half a dozen guys in a, in a hillside and they would sleep on that hill for the next four or five days with massive crowbars and they would rip the area past and catch every single reptile they get. And we would look at a mountain range and say to this collector, well, let's take a drive there and go see what we can find. And he would say, don't bother, we've been there. We've done it. So in the past, you know, it was uh, uh, skinks going out at a random skink. That's, that market is, is no longer in existence. The reptile trade has boomed over the past few decades, with worldwide reptile fairs showcasing the vast variety of animals for sale. Unfortunately, there are loopholes in the system that are being used by people exploiting our wildlife for profit. Today, the market is much more sophisticated and specialized, and of course, the money is far, far greater. I think smuggling, well, that's still going on. It's becoming more and more difficult. There are more parcels being x-rayed. And if again, if you think of this sort of money, you know, a, good, a suitcase full of ra rare reptiles is probably worth two or three or four million rand. If you have a, so what if you have to pay a 50,000 rand bribe? It's not big money. So what is happening is there's more and more of this, uh, this laundering where people are, there's a stamp permit that's signed off by a doctor, a veterinary doctor, and the animals are going out with permits, but they are not being captive bred. It's just a big con. After talking to Johan, it was clear that South Africa's reptiles have long been exploited, with a clear list of problems facing rare and threatened species like the sun gazer. 
I spoke to Professor Graham Alexander to learn more about this worrying problem of reptile laundering. Graham has been lecturing at Wits University for over 30 years and has supervised more than 30 postgraduate research projects on reptiles. So as with money laundering, when you launder something, you hide the source of where you derive the money or in this particular instance, the reptiles. So with reptile laundering, what happens is that people masquerade as, as captive breeders of reptiles when in fact they're actually poaching reptiles and selling, selling them into the pet trade. It's, it's very easy to to launder reptiles in South Africa because effectively, even if the, the legislation is there, there is very little uh, enforcement of that legislation. So it's very difficult to uh, measure where organisms come from, uh, whether they have been wild caught or whether they have been captive bred. So there's several groups of Southern African reptiles that have got high demand in the, the reptile trade. Um, there's various types of snakes like the small adders, the tortoises are also in demand, and there's various groups of lizards, especially the quadalid lizards and some of the geckos, which fetch very high prices uh, internationally. Um, the girdle lizards and then of course the dwarf chameleons, very, very popular. Some of them have extremely limited distributions. Yeah, once you get to, the, to Europe, you go to Belgium, you go to Germany, you go to the Netherlands, and the USA is a massive, massive, massive market. With demand for our South African reptiles being this high, it seems like smugglers and launderers will find ways to get them out of the country using the loopholes in our systems and the inefficiency and inadequacies of our local law enforcement to police these issues. But there are solutions. Okay, so the first thing we need to really change is our view of the importance of reptiles in ecosystems and how important they are in conservation. We need to take reptiles seriously. For reptiles, there's no budget. There's nothing. So it's all just random accidental captures. It's ridiculous. So although we have the legislation in South Africa to, to limit the um, effect of, of laundering of reptiles, the laws aren't really enforced. We don't really have the tools to uh, ascertain whether um, a reptile that's sold has actually been captive bred. And so what we are doing now is developing the genetic tools to do just that, but we only have that available for a few species. So we need an action plan. We need the authorities to take responsibility. We need to look at the genetics. We need to uh, impose restrictions on these exports, force keepers to have a genetic uh, data bank. It make them prove to you that what they are exporting is captive bred. Put the onus on them. An important part of my PhD research has been to develop these genetic markers for sun gazers so that we can do parentage tests on lizards that are to be exported for the pet trade. Since we developed these markers, they have been used in cases to deny permits for the export of sun gazers from South Africa. And I'm happy to say that since 2015, no more sun gazers have left the country under the guise of being captive bred. The small victory fills me with a lot of hope, but there are so many other species of reptiles that still need our help, and we have a long way to go to win this battle. Working with people that are passionate about reptiles, conservation, and education, we can make the changes in our country that are so desperately needed to save our dragons. Thanks for watching Seeker Indie's screening of Saving Dragons. We hope it's stories like these about animals you may have never heard of that will inspire the change we need to save them. Because we definitely need more dragons in the world. Now we want to show you our Q&A with producer Siobhan Perusna, checking in on the status of the Sungazer lizard and what is being done to help stop the very destructive wild pet trade. I'm Siobhan Parasnath. I'm a biologist and a photographer and filmmaker from South Africa. I've been doing research on the sun gazer for 10 years now. I started off when I was looking for master's projects. It kind of was at the exact same time that I was looking to start a master's degree in biology. The Endangered Wildlife Trust, an organization here in South Africa, was looking to have a conservation assessment done on the species, basically to see how many animals were left in the wild, how populations are doing, how they've changed over time. My dad always has a camera out. From the time we were kids, even now when I visit him, there's always a camera around. As cameras became more accessible to me, I found them just to be a beautiful way to capture life and to capture moments. And as I went on this journey of researching the sun gazer, it's, it's such a beautiful animal, but not a lot of great shots of the, the species had existed. I think that as a scientist, 
especially you have many opportunities to capture things a lot of people don't get the opportunity to and that's why i think science communication is such a beautiful thing because you can share stories and images with people that are really just not accessible to someone in the general public and it lets you firstly learn more about the world and secondly allows you to care about things maybe you didn't know existed there's a saying that the best camera you can have is the one that's on you one of my favorite photographs that that i've taken was um taken with an old Samsung Galaxy S3 um, about seven or eight years ago. And of all the shots I've, I've taken with, you know, very fancy camera equipment ever since then, that's still one of my favorite shots. And it was used in the National Geographic magazine. It was on the, the back cover of our South African Reptile Atlas. What we've got planned now is the formation of the first sort of uh, reptile working group in South Africa that actually aims to focus just on reptile trade issues with South African reptiles. So the aim for the next, I would say five to 10 years is to kind of get this up and running, to do non-detriment findings, to have species listed on CITES so that they can be afforded better protection. The idea is to have this multi-stepped approach. Of course, we want to continue with the scientific research to be able to use genetics. So it's just kind of taking everything we've learned over the past 10 years and applying it to many other species besides just the sun gaze. You know, my dream is that one day in a few years time, poachers will say, well, I'm not going to poach in South Africa because there's just too much policing. There are two on the ball. You'll get, you'll get, you'll get caught out and there's no way you can do it. You know, that, that's where I want it to be. It's kind of getting there with sun gazers to an extent. And I would love that to be for every reptile where no one dares set a foot here with, with those intentions. This was Seeker Indie, Seeker's independent filmmaker showcase. Keep coming back to see what else we have in store and the amazing stories we continue to highlight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Seeker.